The Storyteller's Thread, a monthly podcast devoted to young adult literature and the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Sean Connors. On each episode, we invite an author for young adults to take us inside their work, and in doing so, to talk about their writing process, their inspiration for writing for young readers, and the general ins and outs of earning a living as a professional storyteller. So, whether you're a compulsive reader, an aspiring writer, a teacher or librarian, or simply a frustrated reader who's counting the hours until you get home and dive back into that novel that's waiting for you on your nightstand, this is the place for you. Thanks everyone for listening to this inaugural episode of The Storyteller's Thread. Before we get into this month's episode, I thought I'd take just a moment to talk about the origins of this show. With the seemingly ever-growing instability and angst, I guess for lack of a better word, of the world that we live in, I've found myself turning to art, whether that's music or literature or painting, over the past few months as a way to, I guess, to center myself. As someone who reads and writes about young adult literature, I've been toying with the idea of producing a podcast that invites authors to sit down and to talk at length about their work for some time. But honestly, it's been difficult to find the time necessary to produce a program of the sort that I felt I could be proud of. Well, that's obviously changed, and I'm excited to share this program with you. If you like what you hear today, please consider telling a friend about us. Likewise, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to rate our show on iTunes once you finish listening to it, I'd appreciate that, as the show's viability is ultimately contingent on our finding an audience of listeners. With that said, thanks again for listening, and I hope you enjoy this month's episode of The Storyteller's Thread. Elliot Schrafer sat down at a computer to learn how a pair of Bonobo brand pants he'd purchased had gotten their name. He likely didn't imagine that his internet search would lead him to travel to far-off places like Congo and in Indonesia to learn more about how human activity is impacting the welfare of great apes. But that's precisely what happened. Today, fresh off of having published The Lost Rainforest, a book for middle grade readers, the two-time National Book Award finalist has published the final installment in the Ape Quartet, cementing his reputation as one of young adult literature's most recognizable ambassadors for conservation. A native of Chicago, Illinois, and a graduate of Harvard University, Schrafer published Glamorous Disasters, his first novel for adults, in 2006. Three years later, he published The School for Dangerous Girls, his first young adult novel. Schrafer is arguably best known, though, for the Ape Quartet. In Endangered, the first book in the collection, a teenage girl finds herself thrust into the position of caring for a young bonobo after war disrupts their lives in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In 2012, Endangered was named a finalist for the National Book Award in Young People's Literature, as was Schrafer's follow-up novel, Threatened, which follows a young boy's flight from society to live with a troop of chimpanzees in the jungles of Gabon. In 2016, Schrafer continued his exploration of the human-animal relationship in Rescued, which examines the issue of animal rights from the perspective of a teenage boy whose family is no longer able to care for a mature orangutan his father brought to the United States as an infant. In September of this year, Schrafer published Orphaned, the final installment in the Ape Quartet, which is told from the perspective of a young female gorilla and which imagines the first encounter between gorillas and humans thousands of years ago. To varying degrees, characters in Schrafer's novels are forced to confront their complicity in systems of oppression as they struggle to determine how to live in a world beset by suffering, animal as well as human. Readers don't get off any easier as Schrafer challenges them to examine their lives for the purpose of understanding how, in our consumer-driven materialist society, One's actions invariably impact others. I recently spoke with Schrafer about his interest in conservation, his writing process, and the future he envisions for himself as he moves beyond the Ape Quartet and prepares to tackle new writing projects.
So you graduated from Harvard University in 2001, where you majored in French and American literature. And you later found your way to New York City, where you eventually took up residence. I'm wondering, as you're packing the car to leave Harvard, did you know at that point that you'd pursue a career as a writer? It's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think deep in my bones, I had the hope of being a writer. Uh, but when I was when I was growing up, my mom was writing in the house. She wrote three novels um, that she kept submitting and that were never were never published. Um, and when I was a little kid, I was um, it worked in my house like it probably does in most houses, where the youngest person in the house is the one that can work the printer. So my mom would print out her books, and I would um, she would like be setting up the dot matrix printer, and I would hear Elliot, and I would come down, you know, in third or fourth grade, and help her sort of print them out. And I think I was learning a lesson without even knowing it at that young age, which is just, you know, that it just doesn't work, um, that this is a dream that you could have, but it, you'll, you'll never succeed at it. Um, so I figured, you know, if my mom can do it, I guess no one can. And so I think I was sort of hedging my bets for a lot of my life. I wanted to uh, do something stable. My dad changed jobs a lot when I was a kid. I considered studying evolutionary biology as my major, which is you know, I'm sort of coming full circle now back to that interest. Um, but I wound up, you know, sort of my eyes broadening to what was possible out there in a life and comparative literature um, seemed to have a lot of answers to questions that were important to me at the time of, you know, what does it mean to be alive? You know, how, uh, how do you deal with sort of a lot of the, the very basic existential questions? And so then after I graduated, I, I lived in Rome for a year. I, I taught at a boarding school. It was a, it's a teaching internship. And then I needed a place to land afterwards, and I landed in New York City, uh, and I haven't really left since. And I, I had a lot of different jobs. I was temping. Um, I was applying to grad programs in comparative literature. Uh, but in the downtime between those, there was just one evening I was out with friends, and I, I said, uh, I'm not sure what we were talking about beforehand, but it just I just said, like, obviously, if we all had a million dollars, we would just be writing novels. Um, my friends just like kind of a lull came over the group. My friends looked at me like, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> that sounds awful. I would never want to work on a book. And that's when I realized I would inadvertently revealed something to myself about myself, you know, that this was just an assumption I thought everyone had. And so it's, it was really my desire that I had shielded myself off from. So that's when I looked into writing as a more you know, you, you live one life and if this is really what you want to do, then give it your very best shot of, of making it happen. So that's when I started really writing in earnest. And your first two books, Glamorous Disasters and The New Kid, were written for an adult audience. And The School for Dangerous Girls, which was published in 2009, I believe, marked your first experience writing for young adults. So what inspired you to make that move at that point from writing for adults to writing for younger readers? Yeah, so my my very first novel I wrote was never published. It was this epic fantasy novel that had a lot of self-referential material in it. And it was, even my best friend, who's a very kind person, couldn't finish the manuscript. So there's that, you know, book zero that's in a drawer somewhere. Um, and then I wrote, you know, I, so I was thinking more towards, you know, what would actually get published or what would be of interest to a broad readership. And I was working a job at SAT tutoring uh, in those days. So I was paying off my college debt by working one-on-one -on -one with the sort of kids of the rich and famous on Fifth Avenue here in New York City. So it was um, kind of a autobiographical, but it got me my agent and got me, you know, my, my first publisher at Simon & Schuster. Um, and so then I, I, I branched out into, I wrote a more dark literary follow-up called The New Kid um, that really kind of tanked, at least as far as numbers of copies, um, sold tens if not dozens of copies. Um, so I, uh, at that point, I was not sure what to do next. And it was actually why it landed on me in a way, because uh, David Levithan, who's then became my, my editor for the next six or seven books, including The Ape Quartet, uh, he read Glamorous Disasters way back and just emailed me out of the blue and said, would you be interested in having lunch? You know, I think you have a, a voice that could translate to young adult. Um, and so over the weeks, we just got to know each other. We became friends. Um, and then he, they have at Scholastic, they have um, this group of editors that uh, come together and they talk about story ideas that they don't have time to write because they're too busy editing, but that they could hope to field out to authors. And one of the in-house ideas they come up with was the School for Dangerous Girls. And um, I'm really terrible at titles. It's not a 
good skill set for me. I tend to come up with these sort of pretentious prose poems for titles, you know, <laughs> so like, you know, rain falling on joy, you know, <laughs> something like that. Um, they always end up getting retitled something much better by my editors. So this started with a good title. I was like the school for dangerous girls. It like gets me a premise. I can imagine the cover. I'm already interested in, in why the school is for dangerous girls. Um, so I, I leapt at the opportunity and, you know, to be totally honest, I ended up writing about this for, um, uh, editorial I did once for the Times about the transition from adult to YA. I at first I really um, I felt like demoted. Um, I I thought I'd given a shot at writing for adults, and that YA had was where I turned once that well ran dry. Like I moved from varsity to JV, um, and I look back at that time with a lot of chagrin. Um, I'm embarrassed of the assumptions I had about YA moving into it. Um, and I re- it was in my work with David on that first YA book that I, I realized, you know, how much potential there is in young adult literature and that really it's, it steers the author in directions that every author should consider going, which is just keep your emphasis on the efficiency of character and story. And, and there's so much less room for indulgence in young adult. I think that's actually the, the big signifier for it. It's less about, you know, teenage experience and more about the the mode of storytelling, which is why so many adults um, are turning to YA because it just promises a a less indulgent story. Um, And so, yeah, so I think, I think one of the reading experiences that I, um, I really don't like is when I receive a very heralded literary novel and I spend 20 pages in love with the writing and I see what everyone is talking about. And then by the end, it's like, I've had a date where the other person just talked about himself the whole time. Um, <laughs> and it was, you know, it was like this, like just, it sought to impress. And it, it, it did impress. I was like, this is a great mind that made this book. But it, the, the curtain draws back and you feel like the actual motive for the writing was not to communicate something to me or bring me someplace, but instead to leave me convinced of the specialness of the author. Um, that's, that's what, YA has very little of that, and I think it's the fingerprints of of that motive are all over adult literary publishing. Um, and it and it were it was over me too. You know, I was I felt anonymous, and the world was zooming by me, and I wanted to make a book that made people stop and say, "Wow, this Elliot Schrafer guy." Um, and that's a it's an understandable motive. I look back at it and I get it, but it's um, it's not a great doesn't make for great books for me. How do you mean indulgent? Why I just made me get over myself um, that I was writing about a different target audience, and so it kind of broke that feedback loop of writing by myself for myself, uh, and instead I was um, writing uh, writing for another audience. When I've talked to YA authors in the past, one of the things I'm always curious about, and you're sort of getting at this in your responses, are there differences writing for these two audiences? And oftentimes people will say. No, you know, you're you're writing a book, you're telling a story, regardless of who it's for. But I, I don't entirely believe that because there are differences in conventions with the two jo- genres, right? Like in terms of things of the degree of exposition you get in adult literature as opposed to young adult literature, those sorts of things. So I wonder, from your perspective, how do you make that move? I, I can't imagine. Is it a matter of just sitting down at a computer and saying, okay, I'm going to write this young adult novel? Or were you turning to YA books to get a feel for that genre? Were you looking at other writers' work? Yeah, um, it helps. You know, I had the, the the luck of my first YA manuscript being in active conversation with a very experienced YA editor. So I didn't um, I didn't have to do the years of groundwork of really studying the genre, I could call David and say, no, I've, I've, a, I've a scene where they're all smoking pot. Can I do this? And he's like, of course you can. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, okay. And that's when it slowly, I, I revealed all my assumptions about limitations in YA, you know, that you would have to fade to black before you had an act of violence or sex, um, or that you couldn't have characters, you know, really sort of speak, speak their minds if it ran to really dark areas. Um, and so that was, you know, through kind of like I, I got to have a Levithan seminar on that instead of, instead of having to study it myself. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, part of it is, you know, so when you're writing for children, you do come across this mentality. You know, I, I write, I teach in an MFA where a lot of the other faculty um, write for adults. There's just a smaller uh, segment of, of children's literature faculty. 
And the, oftentimes I'll do a reading or, or another YA faculty would do a reading, and one of the adult faculty members will say, that was so good, it could have been written for adults. Um, and so I think there's this, you know, the answer is like, it could have been, but it wasn't, it was written for teens, so what are we having for dinner? Um, and I, I think it's um, because there's, there can be this defensiveness when, when you're talking about the place of YA in the broader literary world that I can understand why we would want to answer that everything is permitted um, so that it doesn't seem like some slimmer version of, of literature. Um, but it really is, to me, you know, there has to be some sort of looking into what the experience of being a young person. Um, I think that's pretty unavoidable in, in YA, but how you do it. There's, there's very few hard and fast rules about what you can't do. Um, but I do think readers go into a YA novel with a set of expectations and that YA novels that don't deliver on that uh, in some way might have been miscategorized to be in the genre in the first place. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's a broad group of novels, but I do think there are some conventions that run through. Uh, I want to circle back for a minute. You mentioned um, your working relationship with David Levithan at Scholastic. And I believe he's edited all four of the books in the Ape Quartet. That's right. What's he like to work with as an editor? Um, how do you? How does he influence your work? Yeah. Um, so David is, um, you know, we have a friendship that is as long as our editorial relationship. So often our conversations will spill into drinks or a theater outing. Um, but he, uh, you know, I've worked with other editors, both in my adult um, books and then my more recently my middle grade novels. Um, and I think one thing that is David really brings to the table that I haven't seen elsewhere is a really big stroke edit uh, that he will offer that is just, you can, he can say it in 20 seconds and it absolutely changes the, the frame for a book. Um, so, for example, Orphaned, the, uh, the latest book, the gorilla novel, he did have, I turned it in in prose, um, and he, we had a lunch where he said, you know, I, I don't, know if you want to hear what I'm about to tell you, but I really think this book would work much better as poetry. Um, and it's hard to imagine another editor having the, maybe the courage to, <laughs> to offer such a huge edit, um, but also to, to have not, not just like dived into the pages and made marginalia, which you would have already missed that like large scale note. I think he's, he's just got a very big sense of what's possible in YA uh, and also a, a, a just a lot of wisdom about about very basic elements of a book. I'm trying to imagine you turning in a complete manuscript, only to hear that this might work better as as a, in a poetic form. I mean, what what's going through what's going through your head at that moment? Well, I went through all the stages of grief, basically, um, and I was so at the moment. I just like I wish there was like video of me in this coffee shop because I just like sat back with my, my back rigid and <laughs> was just like, resist, resist, resist. Um, and so it, it uh, you know, his, I, I heard him out. I just, I, it felt like in writing workshop, when you get feedback that feels like nothing you want to take, it's still very useful to sort of, I think, to ask about where the person is coming from. So I, I teased it out with him to figure out where and why uh, he was, he suggested that we change it to poetry. And, you know, it's, he had a lot of helpful things to say that I hadn't really thought about, which is that without it being in poems, snub story, that there is no dialogue because the gorillas aren't speaking to each other. So it would be these long, thick paragraphs, um, description, and the pages were heavy. It took you a while to get through each page. Um, and uh, it would seem it just the book felt uniform and dense, uh, and it, which made it just sort of on a knee jerk level kind of unappealing to to read. And also paragraphs and sentences didn't seem quite like the kind of guerrilla consciousness I was trying to uh, capture in the book. So initially I said, I don't think so. And then I was fuming for two or three days and then I, I saw his point. Um, I've never self-identified as a poet. So I kind of called a couple poets I know to see, you know, if, if this was even allowed, you know, like what makes something a poem. And I quickly understood that you know, it's a really amorphous uh, genre that, um, you know, that, that has, has no set rules. Um, so I just I went in and I tinkered and then I, I really saw what he was what he was saying um, and the book went from being eighty thousand words in prose to twenty nine thousand in poems. Um, it, I just it gave me to be able to like end a poem and then go to the next page and start the next one allowed me to cut out the narrative connective tissue that would have connected those scenes in prose and so the book uh, you know lost a lot of its more 
uh, more sloggy parts and just it's just the highlights that remain. It's really interesting, I think. I mean, maybe we can talk about um, the book now. Um, the, your use of metaphor in that book is really heavy in, in, in a good way. And I think as I was reading Orphaned, I, I found myself thinking that there is something about the poetic form in the way you use metaphor that really allows me to be immersed in the perspective of the gorilla, uh, the volcano that's exploding, being sick and, and things of that sort. Yeah, it was it was interesting to try. So um, I tried to inhabit this nine-year-old gorilla's point of view as best I could without um, anthropomorphizing her. So, you know, she would have experiences where she would see something happen like a volcano erupting and the gorillas don't have verbal communication. So they can't they can't tell each other stories about how centuries ago a, a mountain exploded. And so she doesn't have anything to map it onto except, you know, what she's already experienced, which is something like sickness or a wound. Uh, and so I was, I was just trying to think, like, how would you how would you process a volcanic eruption if you didn't even know such thing could happen? You know, and you have no idea there was something inside the mountain, which even our most primitive cultures would have stories or myths around that, uh, which would help them understand it. Um, but it's with a poem, you know, there's with, with prose writing. You know, we often think that like the, the first line and the last line of a chapter hold extra weight because the reader has to be rested going into the first line just by nature of turning a page and starting the new chapter. So it carries more emphasis. And, and the last line also might be the last moment of that reading experience for the reader. So it, often you get your power lines, I think, in books uh, in those moments. And with the poem, you end up with more of those because of the line breaks, um, I think. You, you, it just slows down your reading experience of the words, just the physical process of reading a poem, um, which I think allows some images to, to sort of sit more uh, more intensely in the reader's mind. Orphaned, I believe, comes out tomorrow. Don't yeah, imagine. this is its, its birthday eve. You've got to be excited about that. I am. I am. It's, um, you know, it helps. Each book that comes out makes you uh, a little less frantic about the the fate or, or what's going to happen once the book's out in the world uh, just because there's there's more out there to carry the weight if a book just vanishes but um i am i am excited to to get it out there and, and see what happens and and get to get to talk to people about so in its original um form as a prose novel was it at that point written from the perspective of a gorilla um yeah yeah so the the prose version of of orphan actually wrote during a residency uh, I was at uh, the McDowell colony a couple of years ago. And I had uh, a month in a cabin in the woods. So it was just, I was sitting in front of this window, just staring at the forest and, and had a picture of a gorilla that I was imagining was my snub uh, in front of me and, and uh, wrote it out in its, in its prose form. Um, I had an outline of what, uh, what I wanted to have happen and, and just wrote paragraph after paragraph. Um, but it was, you know, it's without uh, a sense of, future and past, which is one of the things I thought a gorilla wouldn't have as strongly as we do, that it was hard to make a lot of the usual parts of, of making a narrative weren't available to me. So it, I had to make it a lot more action intense in order to, to have the, the behavior of the gorilla carry through what was going on and what she was feeling, because she couldn't, she couldn't pause and just reflect on the significance of a moment in the way that a human character would. I'm curious, what motivated that choice? So for listeners, the Ape Quartet consists of four books. So the first is Endangered, which was published in 2012. Threatened was published in 2016, 2014, excuse me. Uh, Rescued was published in 2016, and as we said, as of this month, Orphaned. So the first three books are written from a human perspective. What prompted your choice to tell this story from the perspective of the gorilla? Yeah, it was... Um... A lot of things went into it. Um, there was a long time coming. I, I think I've at this point, since I started writing Endangered in 2010, at this point I've had eight years of thinking about apes and how they experience the world and how they relate to this now human dominant world. Um, and it was somewhere I was reading in my guerrilla research, I was reading the memoirs of Diane Fossey, but um, I found even more useful, actually, the memoirs of George Schaller, who preceded Fossey in the field uh, and studied gorilla, was one of the first to um, look at uh, lowland gorillas uh, in, in Rwanda. And he had such sort of charming and spirited anecdotes about his, about what he saw, the gorillas, um, how, they, how they were behaving with, with one another. Um, and I, I realized I, I don't necessarily need the human interlocutor <laughs> in this case, um, that I was, you know, it's, 
threatened probably gets the closest to removing humans um, because there ends the story of a, a boy who's stranded in the jungle with, with chimpanzees. Uh, but I still had this viewpoint character for the reader to access to get through. Um, but I, I think I had had this moment where I was looking at this big stack of books in my room and thinking like all our books are about people, you know? Um, and it seems obvious uh, that they would be, but at, then when you look at it, it seems less and less obvious when you really think about it that sure, maybe the majority of our books would be about human lives and human desires and, and human stories, but there's so much else going on out there and we don't, um, we can only get look at them if there is a human there. Like I think it sells our sells the reader's experience short and their capacity to empathize short to assume that they need a human, otherwise it's not going to be of interest to them. And so I started thinking about what this story without people would look like. And so then when that's how I started thinking of of Snub's story. Um, but I a lot, a lot gets easier when you have a human main character, and so I I, I lost a lot um, by having a gorilla um, central character as far as the the easier ways to make the reader identify with the character. Um, so it became more challenging, and I I think. I needed the first three books in order to sort of build up the skills to present an ape that would be compelling enough to to carry the book and not just be the, um, the secondary character of the book. How, as a writer, how did you try to navigate that? How did you go about making uh, a perspective that is foreign to humans more compelling? Um, I'm not, so I'm, since the book's coming out tomorrow. I guess we'll have to find out if it if it works. But here's here's what I was thinking as far as how I might do it. Um, one is to give her there's there's parts of gorilla ness that are very similar to what we what we would experience. Um, so gorillas, young gorilla females will leave their their birth group um, in order to prevent inbreeding. They will travel off and then join a different group of gorillas. Um, but of course. On the gorilla's level, it doesn't know that it's that she's leaving uh, to prevent inbreeding. She just has an emotional experience of that act. So I was thinking, like, what would it, what would she be thinking? What would be going through her mind that would make her want to leave and 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 leave her family? And I was thinking for Snub's experience. You know, she has she was raised by her mother um, and uh, got all the attention from her mom. But there's a new baby, and uh, her mother has moved fully to just devoting her attention to this this new baby brother. Uh, and Snub is outrage she acts out in order to try to get the attention back to her and it, it doesn't work and so she's just feeling more and more outside this group and that's why she wanders off and she winds up sort of being the most curious of her group because it's it's what she would naturally be feeling at that time um, but also like that's an experience that most kids who've had a younger sibling would would relate to you know, the, the i used to have all my all my mom's attention and now it's now she doesn't pay anything pay any, pay any attention to me so i just try to think of these you know, similar elements that we would have um, between uh, between us and, uh, and a gorilla and, and include as many of them as I could. You know, you mentioned um, that you took on a challenge and really it's a monumental challenge that you're working with. And I'm thinking of times I've been to zoos and seen gorillas and there's invariably conversation with people who are looking at the gorillas in, the, in their exhibit. There's invariably conversations where there's humanness being imposed onto them. You know, we're struck by their similarities, and and I can feel that too. You you look at that particular animal, and you do to an extent see that human quality reflected back at you, or at least you recognize a relationship there. And you've spoken about the challenges involved in not imposing ourselves on animals. I think in a TEDx talk that you gave in 2014, around the time Threaten came out, you suggested then writing the ape quartet, one of the challenges you set for yourself, and I'm quoting you here, was to try to see the ape as itself. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, it's, you know, the anthropomorphism, uh, you know, this feeling that, that the ape has human qualities um, that, that, we, that we share. Um, I have a like a sort of dancing relationship with it because in, in a large to a large degree it's it's important for the reader to feel like oh my gosh it is just like me you know this is it's a way of developing this empathy that like you know this is a creature that goes through joy and despair and and has a, a very similar range of feelings to what I have it's it's one of my goals in this quartet is to to make readers see themselves in animals and see animals in themselves um, at the same time though of course you know, there's 
ways to to go wrong and and I know in orphaned I went I've gone wrong in a in a thousand ways right over identifying how gorilla behaviors what the gorilla might be thinking that probably are are not true to an actual gorilla's experience um, but as far as I consciously could I tried to stay in keeping with with how gorillas would actually act um, and Franz de Waal who's a a primatologist who uh, at Emory University has been talking re- recently about anthropodenial, um, so the kind of the opposite of this anthropocentrism that we would uh, that we would say that like you know scientists are like when Jane Goodall named her chimps that she was going too far and and she was seeing them as little people instead of as animal subjects. Um, anthropodenial that that Franz de Waal puts forward says. Okay, but we are making the we have we have not named the reverse sin, which is denying human qualities to animals. That's saying that that the higher levels of experience are uniquely human, and that that is what makes us so unique. Um, you know, there's a long history of that uh, in our in our culture of of giving ourselves a sacred position that no animal can attain. Uh, it's like deeply rooted in in our the major religions of the world or at least Judaism, Islam, and, and Christianity. Um, and so I think, you know, part of it is I, I want to roll that back. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to commit the sin of anthropomorphism if it means um, that we do realize, you know, the, the, how many feelings an animal can have and how similar they can be. Um, one thing I did in the book was I came up with a kind of a gorilla lexicon. Um, so as I had ideas that I thought a gorilla would have, but that um, didn't really match up to anything in our language. Uh, I just came up with a gorilla vocalization for it. So occasionally in the poems, you'll have uh, a feeling like, uh, for example, who, uh, H-O-O, um, which uh, would express the gorilla sense of what it would mean to be bored. Um, that our word boredom has a negative connotation, but to me, looking at how gorillas act, like they, if they could spend the day lying on their back in a sunny glade and eating whatever leaves are within reach, that is like the perfect day uh, to them. So the who became this kind of positive sense of boredom that a, how a gorilla might see it. Uh, and so this was a way to kind of capture the, the alienness of a gorilla's perspective by having these occasional words that um, just reminded you that this is not a human mind that we're sitting in, uh, so that uh, it was always in play. I guess... I guess my goal was to sort of always have a conflict between um, how much is reserved for gorilla experience or human ex- ex- experience and how much is shared um, and, and to keep kind of playing with that idea. I'm thinking about in Threatened. There's a moment in that novel where one of the characters, Prof, says to the protagonist, our treatment of animals is a great failure of our empathy. I think that's such a a really lovely sentiment. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that in relation to what you're saying. It's 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 it seems to me sometimes that the animal welfare is so is so far off our what we consciously think of as far as needing to fight for the protection of a group that is disadvantaged. Um, it is so not part of the major conversation. Um, I. Was really surprised to learn just last week that um, you know Hurricane Florence, well, while it had a you know a human death toll, um, it had a much much higher one as far as all these factory farmed animals that were right in the place where the storm hit. You know, it, it was two million chickens died uh, from the flooding because they were stuck in their cages, um, and that didn't it didn't really make it into the national news cycle um, as far as I could see. Like it wasn't wasn't mentioned in the articles, um, and it's such a you know, compared to the the tragic but but fairly small human death toll, it seemed like this was important information. You know, it's not you don't have to equate a chicken life with a human life in order to think of it as a really big tragedy of our systems that these two million birds died in the in the hurricane. Um, and so I think it feels like um, the sort of animal liberation ideas are so distant um, that this is like a conversation that might be more at the four 200 years from now that we are in some earlier zone that they will look back and think, I can't believe they did this. You know, I can't believe they raised 10 billion animals in darkness and, and weren't even allowing cameras or, or to, to take pictures of the animals. Like it was against the law um, to take a picture of these, these factory farmed animals so that people would know their conditions, that this was permitted. Um, I think will be really shocking in the future. Um, you know, I was, 
thinking we it's not like we who live now are um, somehow wiser um, or more intelligent than those who lived a hundred years ago. I was thinking I was out with friends, you know, I was kind of having one of those second beer <laughs> conversations where the question gets like a, a level deeper. Um, I was thinking like, so what, so we're not, we're not, we're no better. We just have, you know, culturally we've been, we've had touch points that allow us to get our conversations to regress to this more, what we consider this more open-minded point of view. But what would, what would people a hundred years from now look back at us right now and think, I can't believe they weren't even talking about it. Um, and it, I feel like our relationship with the animal world and natural world uh, is is my answer to that question of like what are what are, what is it what are we so in the dark about that we can't even articulate it or or regularly um, think about it even in uh, progressive circles. As as you were talking, I found myself thinking about the hiddenness of animal suffering in our society or their invisibility. I think in Rescued more than the other three books, you really focus in on that idea. And there's a moment in that book where the protagonist, it's toward the very end of the book, and the protagonist thinks to himself, couldn't get over how simple and so impossible it was, that so much of the world could be invisible and also present, that while I watched a movie on a plane, palm oil companies were still burning and cutting. Pigs and cows and chickens were still crammed into those windowless buildings I'd driven past in West Virginia. My heart said that none of those things were real, that the only things that existed were the ones I was seeing right now. But this was one place where the heart was not the wiser organ. It was the job of my brain to remind my heart that sometimes what it felt was true was not, not really. That injustice often comes from not forcing our feelings to stand up before reason and account for themselves. And for me as a reader, that's one of those points where I put down the book and I just go, wow. This is just so very powerful. Can you say more about that idea of injustice growing out of our failing to force our feelings to stand before reason? Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, we have a lot of cliches that steer us towards our hearts um, whenever we're, whenever the head and the heart are in conflict. You know, it's like follow your gut. Um, but our guts are have evolved this way. Our, our gut reactions, our intuitions have evolved to really protect the 16 primates that are closest to us and are around us. Um, it, the gut, re the emotional feeling, you know, can result in this intense tribalism. And it takes this more intellectual work or learned behavior to care about things that are considered other, you know, which would could be someone from a different country who looks different than you, or it could be a, a non-human like like an animal. Um, and I think, you know, we're our emotions are, they feel like they are some sort of pure and unadulterated thing that we have, but we've, we've learned to have the feelings we have from our, from our culture. Um, and, you know, we, we have a very different relationship to animals. One thing I was looking at in Rescued was, I think we have a very different relationship to animals here in the West than people do in a place like Indonesia, um, which is where John works to get Raja returned to um, because in Indonesia you have monkeys everywhere. It was the first thing I noticed when I was traveling around is that you know every temple would have monkey carvings left and right. People were dressing as Hanuman, the monkey god, for um, dances in the villages, and you would see monkeys in the trees around you. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that when you look at Buddhism and Hinduism, which are two religions that really emphasize this humans as part of a web of other creatures, whether they're reincarnation or shared spiritual sense, um, that those religions came to be in places where you had monkeys around you. So you had this animal that you could look at and think, okay, it's, I know it's not a human, but it's close, you know, that we, there is this step between us and other animals. And um, our uh, sort of Judeo-Christian values that we have in America are, are really born um, out of a region where you didn't have other primates. You didn't have non-human primates in the, in the Middle East. So you would look and think like, okay, that deer is an animal. It probably has a feeling, but we are definitely special. We are truly unique. There's nothing like us. Um, and I think we grew up with that sense of this privileged human, human self that feels innate, um, which is why, you know, you, it's, it can be difficult to talk about animal suffering as something that should be looked at with with gravity um, because people's knee jerk is that that is that is a frivolous 
uh, concern compared to human suffering. And that argument doesn't really hold up if you look at it intellectually, that you're not you're not losing your capacity to work against human suffering by also worrying about animals, um, that there is room for progress on all those fronts, that it's not a sin to care about animals uh, as well as to care about people. Um, I think, you know, it's hard to make an argument against that fact, and yet our emotional selves say human, ri- human lives are more sacred, but that's that's something we've we've learned. It's not something that that children, for example, feel innately. I think you see a, a, this really clear empathetic link with animals when we, uh, among young people, that um, we learn to sort of ignore or glass over as we go into adulthood. Well, I think it's interesting in that TED Talk that I referred to earlier, you, you even talk about how we assign different names to animals depending on uh, whether we're eating them or not. So instead of calling a cow when we would prepare the meal, we call it beef as a way to distance ourselves. I guess. Yeah, that you could you could ignore the animalness of of what you're eating. Uh, actually, my my nephew, I have a five year old nephew, and he at one point just said, like, isn't it strange that you know we call this thing we eat chicken, and we also call that animal with the feathers a chicken? You know, like how funny that they're the same the same name. Um, like they're truly truly were divorced in his mind. You. In, in certainly in the first three books of the Ape Quartet, there's a focus on characters grappling with the plight of animals and the suffering that they're experiencing with the suffering that they know that humans are experiencing as well as a result of war or genocide or famine or poverty. That's particularly evident, I think, in Endangered. There's a moment where the character Sophie encounters an, an elderly teacher and He's watching her relationship with Otto, the, the infant bonobo, and, and he says to her, there are millions of people suffering. Do yourself a favor and worry about them instead. This theme comes up very often in those first three books. Is it something that you grapple with as a writer, this concern for animal suffering while acknowledging there's human suffering as well? It's... You know, not now as much. I did with Endangered. It was deeply on my mind when I was writing that book that I might be, yes, that I might be doing something immoral to write about uh, animal suffering in a country with such human suffering in about in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so I was I was anxious about it, and it was my first time, you know, writing about realistically about an animal subject. So I was always on my mind. But I think it through the writing of these books and the thinking about it, I've I've kind of rolled back a lot of the assumptions that went into my anxiety about, you know, what, um, if there was sort of an inviolable importance to one human life that made it impossible to think about the suffering of, of millions of animals, um, that I'm much more comfortable that we can, we can think about both and that we should be thinking about both now. Uh, and then I, I, I was working against 30 years of training that, um, you know, worry, worry about people. Um, that, that was, that was the sort of unadulterated message that I had. Uh, and I was, I was questioning that really for the, for the first time that if that's the, really is the only, only place we should place our concerns. In your books, obviously they're all concerned with a conservationist perspective, in particular with the impact of human activity on the natural world. What spurred your interest in writing about ecological and environmental issues? You know, I think my my books before Endangered, there was uh, there was a lot of thinking and not a lot of heart in them. Um, I was a kind of a clever writer. Um, thinking about this book, uh, Geek Fantasy Novel, which was initially published under a pseudonym and then republished under my my actual name, um, that is sort of a riff on fantasy tropes and um, was just didn't have. No, no one cried reading that book. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, and so I think, you know, I came to Bonobos by by accident, um, and I didn't, I hadn't had a, an affinity towards apes or a real. I didn't go right to that exhibit at the zoo. I, I wasn't um, wasn't an ape guy. Um, but I think I was I was reading about this uh, experience of one of the orphans who came to Lolaya Bonobo, which is the um, Bonobo sanctuary where I, I went to do the research for Endangered. Um, I was just reading their blog, um, and I was they were just talking about one of these little bonobo orphans who came in, um, and she had, you know, her family had been 
slaughtered for meat, uh, and she was taken to be sold in the marketplaces, and someone had taken her on this boat down the Congo River to try to sell her at village after village, um, and she was just wasting away. She was too depressed to survive, um, and he, uh, the boatman wasn't able to sell her, and by the time he got to uh, Kinshasa, she was confiscated by the police and brought to the sanctuary. And um, she died two days later after she was brought back. But she had this rope uh, wrapped around her waist, which the, the man who had taken her had, had held her with to his, to his canoe. Uh, and she, um, they tried to, they cut it off her and they tried to remove it. And she held on to it really tightly. It was like her last action was to hold on to this rope. Um, and she died holding it. And it was this, just this moment, like this rope represented her worst suffering to me it was this what the man who had killed her family or, or at least taken her from the hunters who killed her family and then tried to sell her on the river it was what he used to restrain her but it was it was all she had left and it was just this moment of like her her great suffering was also her her last treasure as well um it just opened up this huge question in my mind of what what we weren't seeing about what we do to the animal world the natural world um and it it wasn't a question of like, could this be a book? It was the first moment in my writing life where I thought I, I have to explore this. You know, I have to get to the bottom of this. Um, and that's was that urgency that made me write Endangered. In each of your books, I was struck by the preponderance of strong adult women. And not just their presence, but the really active role that they play in fighting for environmental and conservation issues. So Endangered... You have Sophie's mother, Florence, who runs a sanctuary for bonobos, combats poaching. And Osgood, she's, her presence is, is not as strong as Florence's, but nonetheless, you have a woman who travels the world documenting the plight of ape. And rescued, you have Daya, who runs the orangutan sanctuary in Sumatra, and also the protagonist's mother, who is willing to undertake massive debt in order to rectify an injustice that her husband has done by bringing this orangutan infant to the United States and taking it in as a family pet. Is this just a coincidence or do you recognize a connection between uh, women's issues and environmental issues? Wow. I'm, I, I'm like taking notes to bring it to my therapist <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I have, um, my favorite situation to be in among human beings is to be like with a group of powerful women. Like <laughs> it's like, that is my, that is my um, comfort zone. I, um, I think, you know, there's a way in which a book is so much of that that you're consciously putting out there and a lot that you unconsciously put out. Um, and so I certainly didn't have, um, you know, a mission to link our, our conservation with um, the sort of sense of strong femaleness or feminism. Um, but at, at the same time, I do see, you know, women as as the answer to a lot of the kind of male problems that we're putting on the environment. And I mean, male in a kind of broad sense of this male-dominated society that women also participate in. But I, 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 when I've, you know, every time I've gone to do research, it's been working with these these amazing women in the field. You know, you have. From the beginning, you have these, you know, Leaky's Angels with Jane Goodall and Brute Galdikas working with the or orangutans and Diane Fossey with the gorillas. Um, and then, you know, I, at Lole Abonobo, the, the owner of the sanctuary is um, Claudine Andre, um, who is one of the most charismatic people I've ever met and a huge force in the, helping the bonobos. And there's also Sally Cox, who's at the forefront of BCI, the Bonobo Conservation Initiative. Um, I think it's just my... My heart says that women are the answer to the worst problems the world faces and that men are in general the source of the problem. Um, and so that is, that is no, no surprise that that would, it would come across that way too in my books. And there's a line of you know, uh, thought, ecofeminism. Um, I'm thinking, which I, 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 intentional or not, I see a, a presence of that um, critical theory or philosophy in your books of thinking that the problems the environment experiences are attributable to the same forces that are oppressive to women in a patriarchal society. I was just curious about that. I don't mean to send you to your therapist. <laughs> well, I always <laughs> definitely, you know, I was definitely more aligned with my mom growing up than, than my dad. And I, that continues to play out in my books for sure. 
Um, I think it's, you know, there is this, I mean, I can see, I mean, though I love I would, this idea that, you know, this thing is mine, I deserve it, you know, is, is something that has caused women to be kept in a, in a secondary position by male dominant culture. Um, and also that allows, you know, a creature to be slain and consumed, you know, because of course you have the permission to, you know, as a, as a, as a man. Um, so um, it definitely does seem this idea of who has less of a voice and um, let's give them more of one um, seems to definitely link, link the two very much. You very clearly invest a lot of time researching both the apes you write about and the nations that you write about. Can you talk a little bit about what your research process looks like and, and how it shapes your writing? Yeah, sure. Um, so I so usually I'm, I'm researching a book while I am working on the edits for the previous one. So I don't like a, a speed research is is really unappealing to me. It, it makes me think I'm back in college. So I'll I'll sort of spend six months sort of enjoying books that are are in some way related to what I'm going to write next. Um, so for Orphaned, that was you know reading books that were about guerrilla behavior and guerrilla cultures. Um, and I started with uh, Gorillas in the Mist, Diane Fossey's book, and then branched out from there. Um, but I also you know it's Orphaned is set 600,000 years ago, and it's about the first meeting of gorillas and um, Homo erectus, you know, the, the primitive humans. So I was also looking into the history of, of humans and, um, and also what Africa was like 600,000 years ago and volcanic eruptions. And um, it's amazing. There's very few books on volcanoes for adults, but if you're like kids' books about volcanoes. There's thousands and thousands. <laughs> Someone needs to get in there and write, yeah, the popular <laughs> volcano book for, for adults. Um, but it's, you know, I can imagine all these like five and six year olds that are know everything there is to know about pyroclastic blasts. Um, but I will, so I'll read uh, for six months just kind of broadly and, and I'll just underline things or highlight them as they come to me. And I need to have the primary sources can't really be on the scene when I'm working on the outline for a book or drafting it because there's just this feeling of weight to have when there's this huge stack of books next to the computer. So um, I, what I'll do is I'll look at all my highlighted and, and underlined sections and type them up as their own Word document. So I'll end up with this, you know, maybe 40 or 50 page doc that is just the important moments for me as I was as I was researching. Um, and then I'll I'll print that out and so I'll have it with me in my bag as I go to my various coffee shops to, to write the book. Um, with a couple of the books, Endangered and Threatened, I actually, I mean, I outline all my books as far as the story, but I actually moved that, that resource document, the notes from the books that I had read, um, actually ordered those notes as they would a apply to various scenes in the book. So I would get to a scene where there was um, like the AIDS orphanage. And so all my notes about you know, how, how AIDS operates within wartime Congo um, would be all in one place. So I'd have things to look at and, and be, be inspired by as I was, as I was writing it. With, um, with Orphaned, I gave myself more permission to sort of put my notes document to one side for longer periods, um, just because there is so much more room as far as what might be true or might not be true um, 600,000 years ago. So like there's, we know that Homo erectus used fire, but we don't know how. It could have just been for warmth. It could have been to keep predators away, or it might have been to cook food. But um, there's a lot of debate about it, and so I felt, funnily enough, I felt like I, had, you know, more more freedom uh, to sort of make them do what what I wanted them to do, as long as it didn't contradict what what we did know. So um, I, I went off on more tangents with Orphan than I had in the in the previous books. You mentioned too that in, in the process of conducting research, you've traveled and endangered. You traveled to the Democratic Republic of Congo. You traveled to Indonesia in preparing to write Rescued, and even with Orphan, I, I think that you mentioned in the back material of that book spending a considerable amount of time at the Bronx Zoo in New York observing gorillas. How do those firsthand experiences shape your writing? A uh, great question. I, I actually, I was, I was heartened in my research process how much I was able to get out from library research that I, I didn't need to be there to get most of what I needed to have in the books. That there's a lot of first-person anecdotal accounts that scientists will have of their work in the field that would mention a an ape behavior that would be so interesting that I could then put it in 
in the book. Um, but the, the thing that being on the ground really helps with is all the physical details. So, you know, what, like for an endangered, for example, I was really surprised by what the apes felt like. Um, I thought there would be sort of like little squishy stuffed animals, but you actually have a bonobo in your lap. It's incredibly dense because they only have about 2% body fat. So it's like this little ball of wire and the, their hair is incredibly coarse. Um, and it just kind of changed the way I was thinking about them and how I described them. And also, you know, writing about countries that aren't America, I was sort of really leery about contributing to the one story version of that country. Um, so, you know, Congo had a lot of surprises for me when I was actually there, which, you know, I had envisioned this brilliantly sunny, hot country. Um, and instead it was, you know, lower 70s and pretty gray skies and, and very kind of dim light for, for my time that I was there in June. Um, and so it was these kind of surprises that helped, you know, help me try to avoid um, sort of just contributing to like sort of stereotypical representations of the countries. But also, you know, I just, I love being around the apes. I find it really transporting and inspiring. And um, I'm not sure if, you know, sometimes that my motivations feel a little muddy that I might be writing the books in order to go to these countries and hang out with them. You know? <laughs> so it's all, it all gets a little circular in my mind. I wonder when you know that the ape quartet is complete, and as, for lack of a better term, the parent of these four books. I'm curious, do you have an ideal order in mind in which they could be read? Obviously, they each stand on their own very well. But I wonder, do you see an order for them? Gosh, um, you know, I've, I've actually never considered that question. I, since I wrote them in an order that feels like the order they are, but obviously, you know, the books aren't sequels. They don't mention each other. So there's no need for someone to, to read them that way. There is, you know, to go back to our earlier question you had for me um, that I'm still still rattling around in my brain. It was such an interesting question of this sort of gradual pulling back of the, the human uh, attachment figure in the books until we have Orphaned, where we have a gorilla as the main character. Um, that I wonder, I wonder if, if sort of the publication order, starting with Endangered, mirrors that. So that might be, if we imagine the reading of these books as a slow immersion into consciousness of animals and animal consciousness you know that maybe maybe endangered threatened rescued uh, and orphaned is is the right order um i certainly know you know endangered is the one that has a much bigger outreach in the broader world than the other books um it's on you know more district lists and, and state reading and, and so on so i think in general people come to the series through endangered that's the majority of them so that Looks like it'll be the first book for most people for the time going, just because of logistics. I asked you because I I mentioned uh, to you in a conversation we had a short while back that Orphan really hit me in the gut. And without giving spoilers, I think it's going to be impactful. If that's the first book that people pick up, it's going to be an impactful book. But I think the reason it hit me so hard was because it was the book that I read last in the series. And there was almost a sense of... Paradoxically, it's the last book in the series. Chronologically, it would be the first in the sense that it's that moment, depicting that moment where human encounters gorillas for the first time. But I think the fact that it falls last in the in the sequence and the, or in the sequence of that you've written them in, there's almost this sense of having read the other three books, you know what's to come when you finish Orphaned. Because hmm. this is... This is the era that is gone now, <laughs> which is, is when the other three books are playing out in this more human-dominated era. And you realize the magnitude of that, that meeting and what it's going to spell for apes uh, moving forward. And I just I found that really, really powerful. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I love talking to you, Sean. You always have these new ways that you make me see my work in totally new ways, even though I've been thinking about it for a decade. Um, that's That's fascinating. I... You know, I think one thing when I was reading about gorillas is that I realized there was a moment when the very first gorilla met the very first human. Like it had to have happened. It's that we're not, it's not conjectured that it happened. It happened somewhere for the first time. Um, and they, this idea, like humans were not a foregone conclusion. We were, were so much punier and weaker and our teeth aren't as strong. And um, it doesn't seem like a really auspicious creature compared to these gorillas who are so much more physically imposing. Um, and 
yet that meeting point was kind of the you know the curve shifted after after that point and humans became the force they are now and and apes are left to you know a few square miles left in the in the world so um it did seem like a, a kind of a nexus point um i don't know if that means yeah if it if it works better as a coda or it's if readers should start there i'm not sure um but it's it's almost like returning to a, an early theme or, or like a musical motif, you know, like going right back to the beginning and then closing it out. Well, and the, and the series does that. And, and, and you have in the first book, Endangered, you have Sophie caring for the Bonobo. And in the last book, you've got Snub caring for Orphan, who is a human orphan. And again, there's that sense that, you know, at that point, thousands of years ago, um, Orphan is very much dependent on Snub to survive. And uh, as I say, really powerful to think about in relation to the other three books of what that meeting sets in motion for the thousands of years to follow. I was listening to a podcast last week, and I heard Adam Duritz, a uh, singer and songwriter for the band Counting Crows, a moment they were talking about art and music, and he said something to the effect of that, as an artist, you're only ever trying to feel something, and in turn to help other people feel that same thing. As a writer, what do you want people to feel when they read your books? Oh, um, that's a great question. Uh, I think, yeah, I want people to feel connected, um, to feel bonded uh, with something that is bigger than them. Um, I, you know, when I was 17 or 18, I felt the most disconnected I've ever felt in, in my life, just like that no one understood me and I felt I didn't understand anyone. And I ended up actually going into the library just to have a place to be and uh, just looking down the spines of the books and hoping something would help. And uh, I picked up one that was, it said evolution and had a beautiful picture on the front of this animal. <laughs> and uh, I read it and, you know, I was, I didn't have religion to turn to. I didn't believe in God. I was brought, I was brought up atheist, um, but it was reading about the kind of mechanisms of evolution and, and, how we all came from each other you know that we animals sprung from one another and 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 uh, are go extinct but more more come um that it was this wonderful sense of connection you know and, and the opposite of isolation and and sort of a scientific argument against loneliness or at least for for meaning you know that there was an order to all this and a reason for it um it, it sort of saved me um so i think that sense of connection you know can be feeling like you connect to a character um, or, you know, through that character feeling like you connect to the world. Um, so I guess, I guess those are the feelings that I would hope to have, have readers get. So you've officially run out now, Elliot, of great apes to write about. It's true. Evolution <laughs> needs to provide me a new ape. <laughs> Wait a few, a few billion years. So what's next for you? Um, what's well, literally next for me is actually I started a, an evolutionary biology grad program this fall. Um, so I'm returning to those old scientific roots um, and uh, just actually going into the classroom. But I'm doing that very part time. and I'm still writing books. That's always going to be my main focus. What motivated you to do that? You know, it's funny. I, so that first book we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, Glamorous Disasters, which was about my tutoring life, SAT tutoring. Um, I was actually I was able to stop SAT tutoring last year for the first time after 15 years. And at the time, I naively thought, oh, I have all this extra time. I'll just write more. And I didn't. I just like played more video games. So <laughs> I just realized I have this hole in my schedule and I, I, should, I have to do something formally to fill it up. Otherwise, I will just waste my time. So um, I, had, I had always wanted to sort of get back into the classroom um, on, the, on the learning side, not the teaching side. Um, and so uh, it just seemed like a great opportunity to go in and, and learn more formally about something that I and maybe in ways I can't predict, it'll impact my books. Um, but to just get in there and make sure the, the scientific rigor is there. But I have a sort of pipe dream of, you know, there was the Desmond Morris book, The, the Naked Ape, um, which kind of animalized human activity is in, in terms of apes and, and primates, other primates. And so I have an idea of doing something similar for like middle school life. <laughs> so I think having visited middle schools as, you know, a guest author, um, it's it would be so useful for the average seventh grader to realize um, how much 
it really is just ape politics, you know, in group, out group behavior, inclusion, exclusion, the hierarchy showing itself only in times of, of crisis. And it's actually a, a pretty good Bible to middle school life. So I've made the back of my mind, this idea of this kind of nonfiction, almost like a how to of what apes can tell you about, <laughs> about being in a school. Um, but um, I'm still working on uh, the Lost Rainforest series, which is my middle grade series. Um, book two comes out in February, and I'm, I'm working on book three right now, uh, which will uh, be coming out the year after that. So right now I've got plenty on my plate. Yeah, it sounds like you're very busy. One last question for you. As somebody who makes their living in writing, you know, I think that uh, myself included, uh, those of us who are outside of that world and maybe aspire to that world, have a sense of, of what that's like. What's something we don't know about what it's like to earn your living as a storyteller, as a writer? Huh. That's a great question. You know, I was surprised to learn that there is, there, there really, as, especially in children's literature, there's, there's really two different ways of making a living. One is that your book sales are high enough that you can earn from your royalties enough to live on. Uh, or there's this other realm, which is that you, your books aren't necessarily you know, running off the shelves in Barnes and Noble, but you school systems are buying copies or school libraries are, or you're going out for um, visiting schools as a, as a guest author. Um, and that's, um, that's really more where my living comes from um, than, than just sales alone. So um, I think I was sort of assuming you had to sell a, a very commercial book in order to make ends meet, but there is, there's another kind of version of it. But I, I think, you know, another thing that I would say is, is just, your getting published is far less a measure of your talent and your skill as a writer and more your ability to sit with the discomfort of wondering if you're good enough long enough to actually write a book and edit the book and get it out there. Like that is just to be able to be find peace with yourself and, and let yourself actually write the thing, like getting all your emotional life in order to do it is by far the bigger hurdle, I think, than, than the question of your natural talent. How do you mean getting your emotional life in order? Um, it's, you face your demons when you're looking at a blank page. And I know from my work, so I teach at a, a couple of MFA programs and working with students, you know, there are some that when they do produce, produce really great stuff, but it's, it's hard to make yourself sit down and face the page when you don't want to. And so if you just write when you're inspired to, it's very hard to get a book out there. And I think a lot of it is, is forcing yourself to work on something that feels bad right now, but still keep working on it, which requires drawing on some like reserves of emotional strength, I think. So Orphan comes out September 25th. It'll be available. And I wish you the best of luck with that. I think it's going to be really well received. I, I really enjoyed reading that book. Oh, thank you so much, Sean. This is really a life-changing conversation. I feel like I learned so much. So <laughs> thank you very much. I always love talking to you. And thank you for all that, for taking time to talk with me. Yeah, anytime. And that's our show for this month. Thank you again for listening to this inaugural episode of the Storytellers Thread Podcast. If you did like what you heard, please do tell a friend about us. In the meantime, I look forward to seeing you back here next month when we'll continue to celebrate the craft of storytelling. Yeah.